It is now 2 o'clock and we'll begin today's session. I will now throw it over to our, se our session moderator, Nancy Horton. Thank you, Maynard. Um, as Maynard said, uh, my name is Nancy Horton. I'm with the Mid-Atlantic ADA Center, and we're very pleased um, to welcome Corey Smith as our featured speaker for this afternoon's session. Uh, Corey is a certified therapeutic recreation specialist and a licensed recreational therapist in the state of North Carolina. She's been working with individuals with disabilities for 14 years in various capacities. She graduated from the University of North Carolina at Greensboro with a degree in recreation and parks management and a concentration in therapeutic recreation. Corey started her career with the Maryland National Capital Park and Planning Commission as a part-time inclusion support staff in May of 2012. In October of that year, she was offered a full-time position as a therapeutic recreational specialist one, programming for kids and teens with disabilities. In March of 2014, she accepted an offer to her current position as the inclusion coordinator for the northern area, providing access to parks and recreation programs in Prince George's County. So without further ado, I will turn our program over to Corey. All right, good afternoon, everybody. As Nancy said, my name is Corey Smith. I work with the Maryland National Capital Park and Planning Commission, Prince George's County Department of Parks and Recreation as an inclusion coordinator. We are on slide 13. Um, I have over 17 years of experience working with people with various abilities. And I've been in my current position with as an inclusion coordinator with MNC PPC since 2014. In addition to being a certified therapeutic recreation specialist and a licensed recreation therapist, I'm also a certified park and recreation professional. Um, and in my capacity with Prince George's County, I provide accommodations to all of uh, various people with disabilities to ensure that they have access to recreational programming of their choice and that they can be successful in those recreational pursuits. So we're going to move on to slide 14. Um, mental health conditions affect a person's thinking, feeling, or mood. Today, we're going to focus on the mood disorders associated with mental health. By the end of our session, I'm hoping that you'll be able to define an emotional and behavioral disorder, identify the signs of an emotional and behavioral disorder, list three to five tools to help you minimize disruptive behaviors within your programs, and to help create your environment, physical environments, so that they will support participants with emotional and behavioral disorders. So moving on to slide 15, we're going to review the statistics. We're going to go um, mental health by the numbers. And on this slide, we have a picture of um, a line graph, a 3D pie chart, and a 3D bar graph. The statistics we're going to talk of, the statistics and visuals that we're going to cover today were obtained from NAMI, the National Alliance on Mental Health. You may have heard of higher numbers recently. However, these are the documented numbers that we have and um, based on the research, and that's what we're going to be going off of today. So moving on to slide 14. Slide 14 is an image. Slide 16. S slide 16, I'm sorry, I apologize. Slide 16 um, is an image with four circles. And we're going to start with the fact um, one in five children ages 13 to 18 have or will have a serious mental illness. The four circles represent the different percentages. So for the first circle, we have 20% of youth ages 13 to 18 live with a mental health condition. Circle number two, 11% of youth have a mood disorder. Circle number three, 10% of youth have a behavior or conduct disorder, and circle number four, 8% of youth have an anxiety disorder. Moving on to slide 17. Another image we have here starting with the fact, 43.8 million adults experience mental illness in a given year. So in this image, we have three rows of images with a correlating fact. The first row is a picture of five people. One person is
colored in, showing that one in five adults in America experience mental illness. Row number two, 20, uh, there's 25 people, one of them is colored in, showing that nearly one in 25, that's 10 million adults in America, live with a serious mental illness. And row number three is a picture of 20 people, 10 smaller people, and then 10 larger people representing children and adults. Um, all 10 of the children are colored in green, and then five of the 10 adults are colored in, showing that one half of all chronic mental illness begins by the age of 14, and three quarters by the age of 24. Moving on to slide 18. We also want to note um, the LGBT community. So we have another image, and the fact with this one is mental health affects everyone regardless of culture, race, ethnicity, gender, or sexual orientation. Sorry. So the top slide we have, can you go to the next one? Sorry, we're going to move on to slide 18. This is a duplicate slide. I apologize for that. Slide 19 here, the LGBT community. Three images in a column. The top image is three people colored in Three people, two colored in, showing that the LGBT individuals are two times more likely as straight individuals to have a mental health condition. The second image is a circle with a diagonal line through it from the top right to the bottom left, indicating that 11% of transgender individuals reported being denied care by mental health clinics due to bias or discrimination. And the third image is an arrow pointing up to the number two to three times indicating that lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and questioning LGBT youth are two to three times more likely to attempt suicide than straight youth. Again, all of these statistics were obtained by NAMI. Um, we're going to move on to slide 20. Slide 20 um, is four more images. The top row is a picture of 12 people, six are colored, showing that 50% of all lifetime cases of mental illness begin by age 14 and 75% by age 24. Row 2 is a horizontal straight line with 22 hash marks evenly spaced across it and a circle above the 7th and 16th hash marks with a dashed line between them indicating that the average delay between onset of symptoms and intervention is 8 to 10 years. Row number three, we have a picture of a schoolhouse showing that 37% of students with a mental health condition, ages 14 and older, drop out of school. This is the highest dropout rate of any disability group. And row number four, um, we have a picture of a building representing a jail showing that 70% of youth in state and local just, ju juvenile justice systems have a mental illness. Moving on to slide 21. Um, this picture, we're just going to cover suicide for a moment. We're going to, we've got two images. The first is three people, a small, medium, and large, all colored in, representing that suicide is the third leading cause of death in youth ages 10 to 24. The second image is 10 people, um, and the tenth, the final person, is colored in, showing that 90% of those who died by suicide had an underlying mental illness. So we're going to move on to slide 21 and have our first poll the audience. So in order to do this, you're going to be able to type um, A, B, or C. So we just want to check in with these statistics. Did they alarm or surprise you? So A, yes, they were lower than you expected. B, they were higher than you expected. Or C, they were about what you expected. And for those of you on the webinar platform, you can select your choice on the left-hand side. Okay, great. So most of the people joining us today, um, these, this is about what they expected. All right, so we are going to move on to slide 23, where we are going to start, um, let's start defining what emotional and behavioral disorders are. 
So um, a behavioral disorder is also known as a disruptive behavioral disorder. It involves a pattern of disruptive behaviors in children that last for at least six months and cause problems in school, at home, and in social situations. And um, this definition came from mentalhealth.org. Um, an emotional disorder is characterized by, an ex by excessive deficits or disturbances of behavior. The child's difficulty is emotionally based and cannot be adequately explained by intellectual, cultural, sensory, general health factors, or additional exclusionary factors. And we're going to move on to slide 24 to sit, give some examples of what um, some emotional or mood disorders are. So disorders that fall under emotional and mood disorders are um, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, ADHD, anxiety disorders such as OCD, social phobias, post-traumatic stress disorder, autism spectrum disorders, ASD, depression, bipolar disorder, conduct disorders, language disorders, and oppositional defiant disorder, ODD. It's important to note that ADHD can be misdiagnosed and is sometimes actually a conduct disorder. Um, and that's something that we have to, you know, have conversations with parents about and they have to work with their health care provider. According to Mental Health America, research has shown that most children and adolescents with conduct disorders do not grow up to have behavioral problems as adults. Most of these youth do well as adults, both socially and occupationally. When we look at adults and seniors, we primarily see mood disorders in the form of anxiety disorders, depression, and bipolar. So we're not going to see the conduct disorders or the oppositional defiance in adults as they age. Um, a lot of times emotional and most of the time emotional and behavioral disorders are better identified as youth age into adult and seniors. And so that's where we don't see classifications of emotional or behavioral disorders in the adult and senior community. So let's talk about the signs and the symptoms that we're going to see in a child who has um, emotional or behavioral disorders. We're going to move on to slide 25. Um, and on this slide, we have an image on the right-hand side. We have three children sitting together looking at the camera with expressions of anger pouting and pursed lips indicating the whole I'm not listening to you attitude. Um, mood disorders can be marked by unusually high aggression toward people and toward animals, vandalism or destruction of property, stealing or lying, or intentionally breaking the rules. Now we all know kids who do these things on a regular basis. That doesn't mean that every kid has a mood disorder, um, but we have to remember that, that excessiveness for, you know, six months continuous is really what we're looking for. So if we're having those challenges, that's when we may be looking at something that's more than a here or there situation. Children with emotional and behavioral disorders have an inability to maintain appropriate social relationships with others. They have academic difficulties in multiple content areas, and they have chronic behavior problems, including noncompliance, aggression, and disrespect toward authority figures. In adolescents and adults, we might also see signs of substance abuse, like alcohol or drugs. And in children and youth, we can see drastic changes in school performance. So we're going to move on to slide 26, and let's pull the audience again. Do you currently have children with emotional or behavioral disorders participating in your programs? And you can enter your, your responses in the A, B, and C options uh, right in the participants list, right above the participants list. Do not enter your responses in the chat feature. Okay, great. Yeah, in Prince George's County, we have seen a high increase um, in participants with emotional and behavioral disorders participating in our programs as well. So it's nice to see that it's not just affecting us, that it's, um, you know, pretty much coming in across the country. We're going to move on to slide 27. 
And let's talk about some tips for success that we can use within our programs. And these, these strategies can be used whether you're working with children, youth, adults, seniors, you know, they work across the board. And they're not just strategies that are beneficial for kids with emotional and behavioral disorders, but they would actually benefit all of the participants within your programs. As adults, we use schedules, calendars, checklists, and appointment books to keep track of our daily lives. This helps us to keep organized and stay on track to minimize disruptions and frustrations. The same is needed for children. So with that, some of the visual strategies we're going to use are posted schedules and maintaining that routine. We're also going to make sure that we're posting the rules, but try and limit those rules to three to five. Um, when you get above three to five rules, it gets hard for kids to remember and keep up with them as well. And it's harder to enforce too many rules. A lot of rules, a lot of times we see rules that can be lumped together in one instead of breaking them out into multiples. Um, additionally, we want to make sure that we have consistency in the consequences. So when we're talking about the visual strategies and posted schedules, large posted calendars can be visually appealing and a reference of the daily schedule for participants. They're also a great way of communicating with adults, um, the parents who come in, or the adults within your programs. Calendars need to be posted at the eye level of the program participants for maximum impact. The hardest thing is when you walk into a program and the calendars are posted at adult level, but you've got a room full of 12-year-olds who are going to be shorter than you, so they can't see the calendar you know, easily. So whenever possible, you want to make sure that we're allowing time for participant choice within the scheduled activities. If the participants in your programs have buy-in to the activities and they feel that they have ownership in those activities, you're going to see a lot more um, impact and decrease in behaviors with that as well. This allows the participants to feel empowered, like they have control over their own environment and lives. They get to choose the activity they want. We get to control the options to ensure the safety and activity. And additionally, we're going to talk about um, visual cues for supporting positive behavior include the use of pictures for non-readers to reinforce the written words. So when you're developing your calendars, you want to use pictures and graphics um, to correlate to what you're showing on the word. So if, for example, if you're going to go out and play soccer one afternoon, maybe put a picture of a soccer ball in the same box so that way I can see soccer. I don't have to necessarily read the soccer right away. Kids with emotional disorders are very aware of what they perceive as fair. So if something isn't fair to them, this can trigger a disruptive outburst. It's important to be consistent with consequences, both positive and negative, for all of the children in your program. So whatever consequence you're providing for the child who has the emotional or behavioral disorder, you want to make sure that the same consequences are being enforced onto the participants without disabilities as well. In addition to visual strategies, we're going to use planned transitions. You know, these are our hand claps to get attention, our catchphrases, um, you know, we say, mac and cheese, everybody freeze, and then the whole room freezes to get so that you have time to talk without talking over the rest of the group. Playing a specific song, this is good for the younger children. For example, when it's time to clean up, you know, we play the cleanup song, or you have them sing along the cleanup song as they're cleaning up to make it fun. Um, but setting that same song each time so that they identify this song with this transition. You're going to make sure that you get the whole group's attention and let them know how much time is left and what the next steps are going to be. You're going to do this ahead of time. Hey guys, we've got five more minutes of arts and crafts and then we're going to clean up and we're going to transition to the gym for our exercises. The transitions are especially important for kids with emotional and dis behavioral disorders because they are quite successful in the management of the entire, and, but I'm sorry. Transitions are especially important for kids with emotional and behavioral disorders. However, they are quite successful in the management of the entire group. There is no need to single out one kid to transition when the whole group could benefit from the process. So there's no need to go up to Johnny and say, hey, Johnny, we've got five minutes. Johnny's not the only kid in the program who could benefit from that advance notice. So building transitions into your schedule is going to keep program staff accountable 
um, and it's going to remind them to facilitate those transi transitions on a routine basis. If you've got them on the calendar and you're doing them habitually, it becomes a behavior for them. So remember, it can take up to 21 days to build a new habit or a behavior, and a 90 consistent days to change a behavior. So it's going to take a few tries. Um, it's not going to happen overnight. You're not going to see a decrease in behaviors overnight. But with consistency, you will see a decrease in behaviors utilizing some of these techniques. Additionally, we're going to allow for bathroom breaks or other breaks within the program. So scheduling bathroom breaks is good for the whole group, um, especially if you've got those younger children. You know, you say, who's got to go to the bathroom? One kid is not is not the only kid who needs to go. So whenever you've got somebody who needs to go to the bathroom, take a couple of them with you. Um, that way you don't single any particular kid out. But if you offer the breaks in there, kids don't have to disrupt the program or interrupt in order to um, get those needs met. We do know that some of our participants get overwhelmed and frustrated with the different activities. So allowing for kids to be able to step away from the group will give them a chance to regulate their own emotions, gather themselves back together, and then they can re-enter the group without with minimizing the distractions of a behavioral outburst. Um, this is where we're going to be diligent in watching and keeping an eye on the participants that we support or that we know. We're going to be, you know, we're going to see them starting to get antsy. So we might want to say, hey, do we need to take a quick walk? Let's step out for a minute. Let's go calm down and then we can come back in. Um, if we can catch the outburst before it happens, it's so much easier to de-escalate and to redirect that behavior than trying to manage the situation when a participant is already in crisis mode. We are going to move on to slide 27 um, to show some examples of, I mean, slide 28. I'm sorry, we're on slide 27. Move on to slide 20, 28 to show some examples of the visual strategies that we were talking about. Um, so on the left-hand side, we have a picture of a daily schedule. And it's got the words, and it's got corresponding pictures. So when the kids come in and they're going to be working on their homework, we've got a picture of the, a child sitting at a desk working on their homework. When it's time to do snack, we have a pic we have snack, but we also have a picture of an example of snack. That way, kids can recognize it from across the room. Um, I know for me, I have a hard time reading across the room just because of my eyesight, but I can easier see a larger image. And then we've also got pictures of the rules posted with corresponding pictures as well. So if one of the rules is to be a good listener, then we have a picture of a, we have a picture of somebody holding their hand up to their ear as a visual reminder. Or if the picture, if the rule is to use a quiet voice, we have a picture of somebody holding their finger over their lips as a visual reminder. And then you can correlate that with activities within your program. When a participant is getting too loud, there's no need to call them out in front of everybody and say, hey, it's time to be quiet. You can get their attention visually, put your finger over their lips, and quietly remind them to use their inside voice without calling them out in front of their peers. Um, so your weekly your schedules can be weekly or daily, but they should show the order of the times of what's going to happen during that program. Like we talked about earlier, plan for the transitions within the program and give participants time to wrap up from one activity to the next. They should, um, we talked about posting these schedules at eye level, also known as C level, for the participants within the program. Um, you know, we all know best intentions come, you know, we all have our best intentions, but things come up despite that. And sometimes we can't follow the schedule we have for the day. We know through whether it's weather conditions because we were going to go outside or staffing changes. Somebody called out last minute, so now we're short staffed. These things come up, and we have to adjust our schedules accordingly. And that's okay. We know that. We, have, we all have our oops moments. So we have a picture of a little oops man. It's a sad face holding up an oops that we can put onto the calendar if we have to reschedule an activity. But the important thing is to letting the kids know ahead of time. Um, if it's dry erase, we can wipe off the activity and write in the new one. But let the kids know, hey, we had to change the activity. It's raining outside. We can't go outside today. So we're going to do our activities in the gym. 
and letting them know ahead of time is key so that they can adjust and make themselves more aware. They have time to process it themselves as opposed to they saw it on the calendar, they think we're going to go outside, and then when it's time to go outside, oh, nope, guys, sorry, we're going to stay inside today. That can trigger an emotional outburst. All right, moving on to slide 29. Tips for success continued. Um, we found a lot of success in making sure that we're working with the parents and caregivers. We're going to catch the good. We're going to use positive rewards and positive reinforcement. So we have a picture on the right-hand side of a gentleman kneeling down to the level of the child, smiling and giving him a high five as a way of verbal praise or physical praise and, ver and positive reinforcement. We're going to remember that in our positive reinforcement that we're going to be as specific as possible. So instead of saying, hey, that was a great job, we're going to say, I really like how you used your listening ears and followed directions. That was a great job. Uh, or you did a great job keeping your hands to yourself. And we can give a thumbs up as a positive gesture with this praise. And the important thing is to make sure that all staff are on the same page and have consistency in their responses. The last thing we want to do is have one staff say, hey, that's a great job. I really like the way you're keeping your hands to yourself. Or another staff saying, hey, everybody needs to be keeping their hands to themselves. So let's just make sure that we're all working together to, as one team um, so that all the kids know what's going to be coming. Moving on to slide 30. Um, the final tips we have here are some reasonable modifications. So modifying your rules and your policies. You know, for we don't have, um, we have no pets policy in the program. However, we have a participant who has a service dog. Well, of course, we're going to modify that policy to allow for service dogs to come into our programs. We want to avoid games with clear winners and losers. This is going to um, set everybody up for success so nobody feels singled out. We see a lot of kids when they get, quote unquote, out, that they get upset because they're not used to losing. And we know in life that there's always going to be winners and losers. You can't get your way all the time. But in our programs, you know, we can set, act, we can modify activities so that it's a team environment. We like to, oh crap. Um, we like to, I'm sorry, I just lost my, um, so for example, in sharks and minnows, you know, typically in sharks and minnows, when a participant gets tagged, they're out and they're having to sit on the side and watch the game until something else happens. Well, A, that's going to cause kids to be bored and finding other things to do. A kid with an emotional disorder is going to get very upset and frustrated because they got out and they don't perceive that as fair. So by modifying the game, we can say when you get tagged, you're not going to sit out you're going to sit down and you're going to be seaweed and you're going to help tag. So as kids are running through, you cannot move off of your bottom, but you can reach your arm out without tripping somebody and tag them. And they're going to then become seaweed. So you're changing the nature of, you're changing, you're modifying the rules of the game without changing the nature of the game. Staff training is a, going to be very key. You want to make sure that you're providing staff the information that they need to be successful. Um, if you've got kids with emotional disorders in your programs, you're going to want to talk to all of the staff in those programs about the characteristics of emotional disorders and what that looks like, what they can do on their end to set the children up for success. So things to um, avoid, you know, I know for staff sometimes we get in our own habits or we decide we're not going to do something because it's too much work for the day. Um, but making sure that we're sticking to those calendars and letting staff know the importance of doing that. Um, I know in our programs we have a lot of younger staff and so we like to work with our staff on how they talk to participants. So instead of them using the authoritative, you got to do this now, we work with them on phrases such as, I need your help, or could you help me do this, or having the participant look at the calendar so that they can help make the choice of what they need to do. So what are we going to do next? 
oh, we've got outside play next. That's great. Are you excited about outside play? What do we need to do to get ready to go outside? Oh, well, I need to clean up from my homework. That sounds like a great idea. Why don't you go ahead and do that? Um, offering choices. You can choose to go outside with the group after you clean up your homework, or you can choose to sit on the bench because you didn't clean up your homework. Which would you like to do? Um, you're going to avoid things like, that's just not okay. Because for a kid, they're like, what are you talking about? What does that mean? Um, so staff training, additionally, you're going to work with them on behavior management techniques, providing them all of the resources that you can to help them be successful. Moving on to slide 31. So polling the audience, are these currently techniques that you're using in your programs? Yes or no? And again, enter your answers in the um, left-hand side in the participants, right above the participants section. Do not enter your responses in the chat feature. The majority is yes. Majority is yes. Okay. And so those of you who are using these um, techniques currently in your program, have you seen a decrease in the behaviors as a result? Oh, that's the next question. Oh, sorry, that's the next slide on um, slide 32. I apologize. Just a moment. Sorry. To tell. And yes. Okay. It's great to know that these techniques are working. I know it can be very challenging and frustrating when you're implementing new um, techniques and you're not seeing those changes or you're not seeing the response that you think you should be getting. Um, so I want to go over um, an example of a little, we're going to move on to slide 33. Um, slide 33, we had a six-year-old little boy in one of our programs, we're going to call him Xavier, Xavier. Um, and he was diagnosed with ADHD when he came into our program. He was a young man we had not had before. When he registered, he was not identified as having a disability. So he registered and started to participate in the program. And we had the community center give my office a call to say, hey, we've got this young man. Um, he's kind of all over the place. You know, can you come out and take a look and give us some tips and some pointers on to how to help him be successful? So we came out, we did some observations, we noticed, yep, Xavier, Xavier could use a little bit of help, um, maybe help redirection, helping him stay focused, he needed help keeping his hands to himself. So we had a conversation with mom and just said, hey, you know, we see that Xavier is having a hard time following the rules of the program, we would like to help him be successful in the program. You know, does he receive any support at school? Is there anything you'd like to tell us so that we can help him be successful? And mom was like, oh, yep, he's got ADHD. Oh, and by the way, he also has ODD, oppositional defiant disorder. So we were like, okay, great. We'd like to do an assessment with you so that we can help Xavier be as successful as possible. So we used our assessment tool to where we talked about any medications that he might be on. Mom informed us that she was completely against medication in any way. Um, whether it would help benefit him or not, she was not going to put him on medication at all. Um, and then, so we talked about his social skills. He, he preferred smaller groups. 
Okay, he prefers to be in smaller groups and he's registered in a program of 60 kids with a 1 to 15 staff to participant ratio. Now this is a four hour a day program. It meets Monday through Friday. Uh, it follows the school year. It's 2 p.m. to 6 p.m. after school program. So we're like, all right, 60 kids, this might be a bit overwhelming for Xavier, but let's look and see what we can do. In addition, in addition to liking small groups, Xavier doesn't necessarily always get along well with his peers, according to mom and his assessment. He does not get along well with adults, which is all characteristic of that ODD. He does not like authority figures. Um, in addition to that, Xavier, Xavier occasionally harms himself or others. He disrespects others in authority. He, he gets easily discouraged. He runs away. The whole gamut, when you think of your classic child in crisis with oppositional defiant disorder, Xavier is your, um, Xavier is your classic participant. So we met with the mom, decided we were going to provide accommodations to increase the staff to participant ratio to help Xavier be successful. So we provided a trained inclusion support staff who had been through behavior management training, um, disability characteristics training. We had talked about schedules and um, putting them into the program to help the program better accommodate Xavier. We worked with this with this program on better utilizing their calendars and putting them at visual locations. So we went in and made a lot of modifications to the environment to help Xavier be successful. Whether it was breaking the groups into breaking the program into smaller groups to make it more manageable, not only for the staff but for the participants. So instead of keeping all 60 kids in one room together, we divided them into groups, three groups. This way they could be in different areas of the community center without all 60 kids being in one room rallying each other up. They were able to rotate the different activities that they were doing. This made it easier for the staff to manage, but it also made it easier for Xavier to be engaged with his, program, with his peers. So um, Xavier continued to have, be um, unable to follow the directions, even though our staff was reviewing the directions, the rules with him on a daily basis. We would come in, hey, Xavier, how you doing? Do the check-in. All right, let's re review the rules for today. And Xavier could tell you exactly what the rules were. He could tell you what, what he was going to do that day to follow the rules. But then five minutes into the program, 10 minutes into the program, Xavier was running around taunting other kids, teasing them, pushing their heads to the table, not keeping his hands to himself. Um, he showed aggression towards others, ex especially in those competitive games that we talked about. So kickball, dodgeball, any game where he perceived that there, that there was a winner or a loser. If we modified the game so that his activity changed as opposed to getting out, he still perceived it as he had lost, um, which was a big challenge for us. He continued to use inappropriate use of language and profanity toward our staff and toward the other participants. And he was non-compliant with adults who were giving him directions. And even though we gave him that advanced warning of transitions, he um, he still had difficulty with transition. So we added in some visual transitions. Instead of just telling Xavier we were going to transition, we added in timers. Um, this particular facility, it has a front desk in the lobby, um, one office behind the front desk for the staff of the facility. It's got that general storage area. It's got restrooms. It had a multi-purpose room, a computer lab, a large gymnasium. And then outside the facility, it had a playground, a sports field, a natural hiking trail, and the parking lot. So we worked with the staff at that program to make better use of all of the amenities that the community center had to offer in rotating the activities. We knew that Xavier was going to get riled up in the gym. 
So we knew that to help him be successful, his group needed to do homework first. That way he could come in and while he was still in school mode, he could sit down and get his homework done and out of the way before transitioning to the active games. Because once we got into the active games, we were not going to be able to bring him back to focus on homework. We weren't changing the nature of the program. We were just modifying the rotation of the groups to set his group up for him to be successful. Um, so some of the challenges that we had with Xavier was he would blatantly tell us the rules don't apply to him. He doesn't have to listen and do what we want, what he, what the rules are. He had difficulty controlling his behaviors and self-regulating. He had challenges in exhibiting um, his behavior and aggression toward others, even with the inclusion support staff. Um, there were times where he took aggression out on the support staff. So we had to continue to work with the mom in our continued conversations with him. Mom brought up that she thought he might be bipolar because she was bipolar. So we see that um, that family history come out. And each conversation with mom, we got a little bit more information about Xavier so that we were able to adjust and modify the accommodations that we were providing to help him be more successful. So we did not change the nature of the program. We still had the rules. We made sure that the rules were consistent. We set clear limits and had clear consequences and Xavier helped to come up with those consequences. So Xavier, when the rules were broken, he set what his consequences were. Um, and then those were consequences that we could use with other participants as well. A lot of the times the consequences that he chose were consequences that we would use within the program anyway, but by having his buy-in and having his feedback on those, it gave him the power to be using those consequences. So Xavier, you're not following the rules. You are not keeping your hands to yourself. What is the consequence? And he would say, I need to go sit out for a few minutes. So then Xavier would go sit out. He was six years old, so he would sit in time out for six minutes. Um, after he had calmed down and was ready to talk again, the staff would debrief with him. All right, Xavier, what did we do? Why did we have to sit out and time out by ourselves? And having that conversation with him helped him to identify and realize, okay, I could not keep my hands to myself. I had to sit in timeout. I did not like sitting in timeout. I need to keep my hands to myself. It took a lot of repetition and a lot of practice, um, but ultimately Xavier has gotten a lot better. Xavier has gotten a lot better in the program, and he, um, you know, is keeping his his hands to himself and not putting his hands on the other participants. So we have the daily routine and schedule posted. All of the kids get chances to choose what games they want to play. Xavier sometimes gets to choose the game in the gym. Sometimes the other kids get to choose the game in the gym. But setting it up ahead of time so that all the kids know that at some point they're going to get to choose the activity lets them know that A, they have something to look forward to, and B, you're not always picking the same kids to choose I'm going to get my turn too. So it sets that fairness. Um, and then increasing that staff to participant ratio was also beneficial because when Xavier needed a break, we had the additional staff within the program who could take him out to help him calm down and to help him de-escalate. Because when he got into his moment of frustration or his moments of anger, trying to have a conversation with him during that time like the general rec staff would do, we know was not successful because when Xavier was in a moment, he's not realistic, he's not reasonable. So we had to give him time to calm down. Having the additional staff within the program allowed the general recreation staff to be able to facilitate the activity on a daily basis or facilitate the program without disrupting the program because they could remove kids from the room to give Xavier his moment that he needed by taking away the audience. And once he realized he didn't have an audience and nobody was paying attention to him, he would de-escalate a lot more quickly. And then we were able to have a conversation with him about the rules and the expectations. 
we also used um, a reward system with him. So we worked with mom to put together um, a calming box that had manipulatives or drawing materials, other things that Xavier enjoyed doing so that when he was having a frustrated moment, we could utilize that box to help him de-escalate or calm down. Mom identified that he was more easily aggravated when he was hungry. I don't know about y'all, but I get hangry sometimes. So I know that my mood is affected, affect, is driven by my hunger. Same thing with Xavier. If he was hungry, he was more likely to catch an attitude with staff. So working with mom to have snacks provided at the community center so that when he was there, if he needed more snack than what was being provided, he had that option available to him. He could come in off the bus and have a snack before the program really got going so that he wasn't meeting that need of having to follow directions, but I'm still hungry and frustrated at the same time. Um, in addition to providing the trained support staff, we went in and did training with the facility staff. And we made sure to catch Xavier doing the good. So calling him out, Xavier was very much in that whole, I need attention, it's all about me. So instead of focusing on the negative behaviors, we focused on the positive behaviors and made sure to call him out in front of his peers, and not just Xavier, but we tried to do this with all the kids. Um, but call him out in front of his peers about the good things that he's doing so that he's getting that positive attention instead of the negative attention. We did a reward and a sticker chart with him where he got to choose his own awards. Xavier really thrived off of staff interactions and personal interactions with staff. So one of his rewards was at the end of the week, he could choose a staff to have personal interaction time with. So while the entire group was playing a game, maybe Xavier got to sit on the side and have a conversation one-on-one -on -one with the staff of his choice. And that's something that he wanted and he thrived off of. So allowing him to choose the awards that he was working to, toward gave him the buy-in to say, I want this, I want to earn this. So he had daily rewards where he would get um, a bracelet that said, I had an awesome day, or he would get a little certificate that he could take home to mom, because we know that parents with kids with emotional and behavioral disorders are always getting those negative phone calls. They're always getting the phone calls, this happened at school today. So we wanted Xavier to have the option to say, look, I shown today. Today was a great day. Let me show you what I did to focus on that positive with his mom as well. Um, and then he had the bigger award rewards at the end of the week. So he got to go into the computer lab during free time, um, which normally is only open on one day for a group. One of the rewards was that they would open the computer lab at the end of the week during, reward, during free time, and Xavier could go in there, in addition to some of the other kids could choose to go in there during um, free time. So we allowed for breaks with him to be able to regroup. We took him out of the room. We took the audience away, which helped him de-escalate. We did advance notice of transitions, both visually and verbally with him. Um, we worked with staff to let them know the assessment tool. We shared the information on the assessment tool with the staff so that they could be aware as a whole staff, not just the inclusion support staff, but as a whole staff to be able to provide um, the necessary supports that Xavier needed. It can't be just one staff is meeting his needs, but the whole program, all of the staff need to be able to meet those needs for that consistency so that he couldn't try and play one staff against the other. Um, our goal was to reduce the number of suspensions that Xavier had because we know the last thing um, that we want to do with kids with emotional and behavioral disorders is to suspend them from the program. That's not going to benefit them in any way and it's not going to benefit, it's not going to change their behavior is what this research has shown. Even from schools, um, it's only going to reinforce the negative behaviors. So the last goal or the last method should be to suspend the kid. Our goal is to keep them in the program at all times. We work to build positive guidance and behavior supports with him. Um, 
And so Xavier has actually gotten to the point now with all of the supports that we were providing for a consistent two years, he is now participating independently within the program. Um, the staff have the knowledge and skills to help him be successful without additional inclusion support staff being there. And that's the ultimate goal, is for kids to be able to participate um, independently. That's really what we want to get to. So, you know, like I said, Xavier has been with us for two years and he is now participating independently. So as you can see, it's a long process. It's not something that we can get done overnight. Um, with Xavier, it wasn't even 90 days. It took a lot longer than that. But um, he has gotten to the point where he is now participating independently. And it's just amazing to see all that hard work, the dedication from our staff paying off um, to help him be successful in the program. So we're going to move on to slide 34. Nope. Yeah. Um, and if you have any questions, now is the time. So for those of you on the webinar platform, you can type and submit your questions in the chat area box. You can press control on the keyboard and enter the, the text into the chat feature. Uh, your questions and comments will only be visible by session moderators. If you're connected via the mobile device, um, you can, uh, via a mobile device, you can submit questions in the chat area within the app. You can also email your questions at adatraining at transcend.org. And at this point, uh, the first question we, uh, we have is, do you have a, 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 do you, how do you differentiate between someone who has an EVD or just a kid acting out? Okay, so we all know that kids express challenging behaviors at times. We all know that kids go through those periods of defiance. They're, they want to have control over their own lives. The difference between a child with an emotional and behavioral disorder and a child just acting out is that kids with emotional and behavioral disorders are going to take it to the extreme. And they're going to be more repetitive with it. Um, so we talked about earlier that six month time frame. Um, so if it's an extended period, you know, you come in one week and you're having a bad day. Everybody has a bad day. Um, you come in the next day, still having a bad day. Okay, all right, well maybe we're just having a bad week. We're talking with the parents, we're checking in with the parents, seeing what's going on. You know, it's been going on a little bit longer, they're having challenges in school, mom tells you they're having challenges at home. We can have that conversation with the parents like, hey, you know, we're seeing all these challenges you know, across the board, have you talked to the, his health care or his or her health care provider about what's going on to see if there's something more going on? And Nancy, uh, do we have other questions? Yes, we did have one other question uh, submitted a little bit ago about the uh, language disorders being, people with language disorders being included in this category of uh, emotional and behavioral uh, disorders. Um, the person saying, I, you know, could you speak to that a little bit more? Sometimes language disorders don't, don't necessarily have uh, mood changes or behavior issues that, that uh, go along with that. Um, you're right. Sometimes a language disorder is just that. Um, when I was doing the research, language disorders came up as a possibility. Um, and I think in that respect, it's more a language disorder in conjunction with something else, not a language disorder just in, a, in and of itself, if that makes sense. Thank you. Um, we have another question uh, from someone who says, you know, when we do have a situation where the, the parent has tried all these various ways of praise and positive reward and uh, all the positive reinforcement, but the child continues to, to struggle and kind of fluctuate with good days and bad days, both at home and in school, the parent and the child are, are becoming overwhelmed, um, do you have any ideas specifically for that? So I think the first question is going to be the time frame on that one. Like we said, it, it can take 90 days to change behavior. And I know that's never what parents want to hear. <laughs> that's never what we want to hear in our programs. It's not what our, what our program staff want to hear. Um, 
so that consistency for that 90 days is going to be key. And kids are going to have bad days within those 90 days. Um, they're still going to have those challenges. With Xavier, we had to do, um, we had to change his rewards often. Every week it was different rewards with him. So, hey, Xavier, what are you working for this week? And so by him not always having the same reward because that got old and stale, by changing up the rewards, that seemed to help him. Um, but repetitiveness and patience is really the key. And unfortunately, that's never the answer that anybody wants to hear. We want that quick fix. Um, and unfortunately, that just doesn't always happen. Well, thank you. That's good advice. Okay. We just have to keep plugging away. Um, we do have another question about the assessment tool that you mentioned. Is that is that a resource? Is that a tool that that you could share? Absolutely, I'm happy to share that. We for Prince George's County for Parks and Recreation, we call it a disability accommodation form, um, and it's a tool that we fill out um, with the parents. It talks about safety concerns, talks about social skills. It talks about activities of daily living, health needs, communication styles. Um, but yes, um, at the end of the webinar, I will share my email. And you're welcome to email me, and I'm happy to share that with you. And Nancy, if you're talking, press the talk button, please. Um, we do have a question about this concept of letting kids choose their own consequences or rewards. Um, do you ever have any challenges in kind of managing that, or what um, strategies do you have if kids seem to be uh, unrealistic or unreasonable about having those choices? Um, that's a that's a great question. We had situations with Xavier where he said. Um, you know, that doesn't apply to me, so I don't have to have consequences for that. And so we had to remind him that these are the rules of the program, that there are consequences for all of our actions, both positive and negative. Excuse me. And so um, helping guide him to choices was what worked for us. So giving him examples of what a reasonable consequence was. Xavier, these are your choices and consequences. Which consequence would you like to have to choose from kind of thing? Um, does that answer the question? Well, it certainly seems like a great idea. Um, we actually have a question that I think kind of tags on to that pretty nicely, and someone would like to know if you have any suggestions or maybe examples uh, about these sorts of strategies for older students, you know, teenagers or transition age students. Yeah, so I mean, it's the same concepts, just maybe the consequences are going to change depending on the nature of your program. So as the um, participants get older, you know, maybe timeout is not going to be the option. Um, but maybe sitting or doing an alternate activity that's not maybe the most ideal activity. So instead, you know, the group is getting ready to go into the computer lounge, and they're going to get to choose what activity they're doing on the computer during that activity. Well, maybe the consequence is instead of going into the computer lounge right away, we're going to read a book on social skills before we go in. Um, to remind us what the appropriate actions are going to be. And then after we do that, then we can go join the rest of the group and have that computer skills or that computer choice time. Great suggestions. Um, we have another question here um, about how to kind of get this, get the buy-in from the general recreation program staff. Um, someone is saying, we really, uh, you know, we have these same kinds of practices and things that we try to put uh, into play in our programs. However, we sometimes struggle with getting that buy-in from the general staff to get them on board and get them to implement these 
these strategies uh, consistently, um, and maybe even uh, at times in some programs, maybe there's some some resistance. So do you have any kind of advice on how to sort of get that buy-in from the other staff? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, we had that exact same challenge with this particular program when we first went in and when they were first trying to accommodate Xavier. Their quick and dirty response was, he's just not working out in this program, he needs to go. And clearly that's not how things are going to go. We're going to be like, nope, sorry, we can't do that. He is going to be in your program and I'm going to be here to support you. Um, I'm happy to come in as much as it takes and I think there were times I was in that program for an entire week straight um, just to help them with that consistency and I think ultimately they just got tired of seeing me and got tired of me nagging on them um, to say hey where's your calendar what's posted what are we doing next and coaching them and prompting them and just staying on top of it um, that I think ultimately that they just did it to get me out of their hair <laughs> and I don't know if um, you have the time available to be able to do that. Unfortunately for me, my office is a two-staff office um, and we have about seven after-school programs that are running at one time. So when I needed to be out at this particular center on a more frequent basis, my counterpart in the office was able to support and manage the, others, um, the other programs as well. So it sounds like maybe some of the same strategies that work with kids work with adults. A little consistency, a little uh, reiteration maybe goes a long way. So that's Absolutely. a good tip. Um, we do have another question about, and I don't know if you have any experience in this, but someone is asking if you have any tips or insight for a program that's more like a drop-in type of program where you're having folks that are coming in without uh, a lot of background information, you don't have this opportunity, you're maybe not interacting so much with the parents, um, and you're just sort of having folks drop in, you may have some behavioral issues. Do you have any, you know, tips for how you could do something in a, in a setting like that where it's a little bit different? Absolutely, we have um, we have tons of drop-in programs in parks and recreation, um, and so with that, we never know who is going to be showing up when. So with our department, we have a welcome policy. You know, we welcome participants with disabilities register two weeks in advance to request an accommodation. You can't do that with a drop-in program. There's no registration associated with it, but that does does not mean that we're not, not going to provide an accommodation. So if we have a participant show up for a drop-in program and we're seeing some challenges and we're seeing some struggles, we might talk to that parent and let them know, hey, you know, here are the rules of the program, here are the expectations, we're seeing that these rules are not being met. We would hate for your son or daughter to not be able to come back and participate in this program, so we'd like to offer you the opportunity to maybe send in a caregiver or a companion who can come with them at no additional cost, but can help guide them and remind them of the rules in the program and help to moderate those behaviors. Um, sometimes we, we set it up that the companion has to be at least 14 years old. Um, it depends on your agency's rules and policies for volunteers. But they can come in um, at no additional cost. Sometimes it's a peer buddy, uh, another person from the neighborhood who's familiar with them and who has a relationship with them. So they'll just come in as a personal companion to support them within those drop-in opportunities. Fantastic. Thank you. We're just getting so much great information here this afternoon. Um, we also have a question from someone who would like to know if you have any specific suggestions or resources for working with really young children, like children uh, with autism who are under two years old, like uh, you know, a year and a half old. Um, most of our programs start at age three. So I have not personally um, worked with providing accommodations to support kids who are under three years old. 
Um, and even our three-year-old programs, they're usually only half-day programs. Um, I think it's going to be the same strategies and the same techniques, but um, I know that diagnosis is also very unlikely at that age due to the nature. Doctors are usually going to wait to a little bit older. Um, and I know a lot of parents fight that because early intervention is key. Um, but like it's going to be the same strategies and the same techniques with that younger age group. Okay, great. Um, we have another question here about fetal alcohol syndrome and whether that is uh, you know, possibly uh, another example of something that would manifest with these kinds of behavioral issues. Um, do you have any experience working with kids with that particular syndrome? And if so, have you found that these same sorts of approaches and strategies are successful? I have not worked with kids with fetal alcohol syndrome since I was in high school. <laughs> um, my first experience working with kids with fetal alcohol syndrome were in a sleepaway summer camp. Um, and I was not even aware of all of these strategies at the time. So I have not personally had the opportunity to work on implementing them um, working with kids with fetal alcohol syndrome. So unfortunately, that's not a question that I'd be able to answer at the moment. Um, well, we have another question here about when you might think that it's suitable to assign additional staff and how you go about making that determination. Is it based on some sort of an assessment tool or some kind of specific criteria? Is it a judgment call? How do you go about making those decisions? Yeah, so all of the accommodations that we provide are are individually based. So we use that um, disability accommodation form that I referenced. Our, our office is trained staff who have a background in disabilities. So it's not a call that the general recreation staff are going to make. It's a call that my office makes. We review it. We talk to the parents. Um, we try and talk to the parents about what supports they're receiving in school because the Support staff is not always the only accommodation. Sometimes if you can work with the program staff and train the program staff, the additional staff is not necessary. Um, we also remind parents that we're providing staff to enhance the ratio of the program. We're not providing that one-to-one -one or dedicated aid. If we find that enhancing the ratio of the program has not been successful and that that participant is taking is still taking that extra um, attention and needs somebody consistently with them constantly, you know, standing right by them to intervene at the drop of a hat, a moment's notice, then we're going to work with the parents. We're going to have a parent meeting to discuss what our challenges have been, what accommodations we have provided so far, and let them know that we'd like to increase our accommodation. So we've done A, B, and C. Now we're going to move on to changing the nature of our accommodation. We're going to pr we are now going to provide that one-to-one -one support staff. So we have that direct staff go in, and as a one-to-one, -one, we tell the kid, you know, this staff is going to be on you. They're going to be within arm's reach of you at all times. Um, we actually did this with Xavier, and we found out that with him, it actually made things worse. Xavier didn't like to be hovered over by the staff. He wanted the staff's attention when he wanted it. So by working with him to say, okay, you don't want this staff hovering over you all the time. You know what the rules are. You need to follow the rules. Show me that you can follow the rules, and we can back the staff off. So we were able to use that as a motivation with him to help him be more successful. Thank you. Um, we actually have a couple of questions that are kind of in a similar vein, and so I'm going to try to sort of combine and, and paraphrase here. But a couple of folks are saying um, things to the effect of, you know, do you ever get to a point where you feel that you can't uh, go any further or do anything more? Um, what, you know, if you, do you have kids that are 
truly aggressive, violent, uh, things of that nature. Maybe you've been doing all of these strategies and things for months and months uh, without success. Um, do you have any experience with that? What do you do if you feel like you're sort of getting to the end of your options? Absolutely. Um, that's, that's a great question. Yes, we have definitely had that challenge. Um, I had a little boy two summers ago who um, we had never had before. He registered for one of our summer pro playground programs. Our summer playgrounds are um, a nine, there's eight-week program, 9 a.m. to 3 p.m., Monday through Friday, and they are loosely structured programs. Um, so it's the participants in this program, it's another, it's a 1 to 15 staff to participant ratio, and we can have up to 120 kids in these programs. So I had a little boy register, and the first day I got a phone call from the center, you need to come out here. You need to come out here now. I've got this kid attacking everybody. I don't know what to do. So we go out and we um, meet with him. We call the parents. We have a parent meeting. And in that meeting, the little boy says, well, according to my IEP, I'm not supposed to be in groups of more than 15. OK. <laughs> so all right, so we talked to dad. Um, so dad, according to his IEP, you know, this is going to be a very overwhelming environment. And ultimately, we want to set your son up for success. The safety of all of the participants in our programs is of vital importance, and it is our number one goal. Um, and it's our number one priority is to make sure that every participant, including your son, is safe at all times. So um, let's look at some other program options. This probably isn't the best program to help him be successful. What other options do we have? With this particular little boy, we happen to have a playground program that only had 30 kids registered. It was still a large program according to his IEP. Um, but dad and this young man wanted to give it a try. So we re-transferred his registration to another program. Um, and we continued to provide accommodations. And um, we ended up having to call park police on him a couple of times because he was so physically aggressive attacking our staff and attacking the other kids. Um, we had several parent meetings. We tried a couple of different things. And ultimately, we had to say, um, you know, unfortunately, this program, these programs that we are offering at the moment do not meet the needs, do, are not set up to be able to support your son. Um, we want him to be successful, but safety is our number one priority. And he is not meeting the eligibility requirements of this program. And the eligibility requirements are that you follow the rules with or without reasonable accommodation. Since he was not able to do that, we um, looked into other program opportunities in the community and provided that information to the parents. Um, we can't accommodate him, but here are some other resources available to you um, so that it wasn't here, you got to go with nothing, but we at least tried to provide other opportunities. Um, now, whether the parents decided to take advantage of those opportunities, that was on them. Um, but we at least kind of had that information available for them when we were having that conversation of we've reached a point, we have tried everything safety-wise, we cannot accommodate your son. Thanks. Um, great answer. Um, we, we have a question about how you train and support your general uh, staff. Um, if you could maybe talk a little bit about um, how you go about that. Is it, is it pretty much sort of situational and individualized? Do you have any kind of formal training or sessions or anything for your general staff? Or maybe you could tell us a little bit about what that looks like. So all of our staff, general recreation staff, go through um, programming training. They go through you know, training on how to successfully set up a program behavior management training. But then um, our inclusion support staff, the staff that we send in to increase the ratio of the program, they go through additional training. They go through a more rigorous behavior management training. They go through um, disability characteristics training, where we talk about all of the disabilities that they could possibly be accommodating, what the characteristics of those disabilities are, and different ways to support them. And then once we identify that we have a site 
that is in need of more training, we'll go out and do hands-on training with that particular site and with that particular program so that we can tailor the training to the needs of that particular child because we know that every child that we support is going to be different or that participant, um, whether it's an adult or a child every accommodation that we provide is going to be different. So we go out and we meet with the staff on site and we do hands-on training with them or we do training during staff meetings with them. Um, and it can be repetitive and ongoing training. So it might be we have an hour training on Tuesday night and then the next month we have an hour training to talk about another topic that would benefit them at that program. Fantastic. It sounds like you really are doing so much to um, support inclusion of, of kids with disabilities. Um, we have a question here about um, children, uh, including young children, who are physically violent with their parents, school staff, uh, just general, generally problematic, that sort of behavior to the point where the parents, the teachers, staff are afraid um, to, to try to follow through with implementing rules and so forth. I mean, do you have any experience or any ideas of, or do you work with trying to support the adults, uh, like the parents, in, in and um, dealing with these issues. Um, yeah, so it sounds like uh, the participants with that extreme, they're, that's a kid who's in crisis, they're living in crisis. Um, so we work with a crisis response team in our area um, for Prince George's County, it's called the Sante Group. Um, and so we work with them and they come out and they help us manage the situation in the moment, but then they also act as a resource for the parents to help them navigate those situations moving forward. Um, they're, I mean, they're a crisis response team, so they have that additional training to help them be successful. I know that other counties have crisis response teams as well, so I don't know, I'm not sure where you're located, but I would check to see if you've got a crisis response team in your area that you could partner with or develop that partnership with to um, provide the extra additional resources that are outside of our specific scope of practice. Um, when a kid, when a participant gets to that level or when a person gets to that level, they're not meeting the eligibility requirements of our program because they are endangering the safety of not only themselves but others. Um, and so we have to take that next step to help them and the crisis response team has been our most successful bet with that. Great, thank you. Um, we have a question here about uh, your program staff interacting with uh, the regular school staff and teachers. Is that something that you do or don't do? Um, if you do that, how do you facilitate that? Um, do you try to get ideas from the folks in school? Do you try to share? Do you try to incorporate to get some consistency? Or is that just sort of a separation there? We absolutely know that consistency is key, um, especially with the kids that we're supporting. So when we're talking with the parents, uh, we often ask if we could be included in the IEP meetings that they're having or if we can have opportunities to talk with the teacher of, the, of their child. Um, and so myself and my counterpart will go in and have meetings with the parents, um, with the IEP team or with just the teacher. Um, we do school visits, we go in and do observations to see what techniques they're using in the school. Um, oftentimes we found that parents are willing to share the IEP with us so that we can review that and then we can pick out the, um, the services or the skills that are behavior related and we can train our staff on how to implement those. Our part-time staff do not go into the schools. Um, but myself and my counterpart will go in and we'll do have those conversations to, uh, to ensure that um, consistency. Thank you. Fantastic. You've been being so proactive um, with your inclusion uh, services. Um, I think that that may be the last question that we have. Oh, we have one. 
more question here that I see that someone is asking uh, if a child is having like a tantrum, um, are there any uh, strategies uh, or tips other than ignoring the behavior that could be used in the moment uh, for, for calming? Um, in my experience, trying to de-escalate a child who's having a tantrum is going to be ineffective because they're not listening to you at that moment. Um, so ensuring that the um, environment is safe, so you've removed all of the other participants, you've removed all of the staff. If that participant is prone to throwing chairs, you have removed the chairs from the, per from the room. You're basically just setting up an environment where they can go at it without hurting themselves um, and just letting it run its course. Um, I've had a situation where we just had to leave uh, the kid in the room and I kept an eye on him from the open, from the window in the door um, because anybody in that room he was going to be attacking. Um, and so just removing everything from that moment and letting him have his moment and then once he settled down we were able to address the situation but um, trying to you know de-escalate him in the moment our our department has a hands-off policy so we do not put our hands on the kids we don't restrain them um, in any way unless they are um, you know an active threat to themselves or somebody else so if the situation can be contained in a room where they're not physically hurting anybody else, um, we're not going to put our hands on the kids. And so that's where we just let them run its course, and then we have then we address the situation after they've calmed down. Excellent. Well, that's terrific. I mean, you have just given us so much great information. Um, we don't have any more questions at the moment. Um, so we uh, we have a, a couple moments left. So if we do get some more, but um, we probably could move on and uh, wind up and give folks our the code that they need. It, we have one more slide, slide 35, um, where I've listed some available resources. Um, these are resources that we have used in Prince George's County. One of the best trainings that I will say that we've gotten recently is um, mental health first aid. You can get it for youth and adults. Um, we have gotten it through Campfire came out and did our most recent um, training. But um, you can look into your local mental health association to see if that's the training that they can provide. Um, all of our inclusion, I'm sorry, all of our disability services team career staff have the training, but we are actually expanding it to um, our team staff and to community center staff as well because we've seen the benefits of the education. It basically just goes out to say um, how to identify somebody who's having a mental health crisis, how to manage the situation until professional help can arrive. So it's just like basic first aid and CPR. You're managing the situation until the professionals can arrive. Um, but it's for mental health crisis. So that's a great training that I would recommend um, people to look into if it's possible. Um, additionally to these resources, I forgot to include my email address, but I'll happily give that to you if you have any other questions or if you need resources. I'm happy to be a resource or put you in contact with somebody else. But my email address is Corey, it's C-O-R-E-Y, the letter H dot Smith, at pgparks.com. And the email address has been shared within the chat feature. So I personally just want to thank you all for attending today and thank you for your great questions. I hope that um, you got some new techniques or some um, great information out of this um, webinar. So thank you. And moving on to slide 36. Um, the uh, Certificate of Participation code for today is Hidden Disability, 
Again, that's hidden disability. And I'm sure I speak for everyone when I say that we want to thank Corey um, for her time and expertise this afternoon. Um, you know, we have just gotten a tremendous amount of great information, practical information. I'm sure that many of us are going to be putting it into practice uh, immediately, if not sooner, with some of the children in our lives. Um, and again, as Corey said, sometimes these strategies um, are very valuable for kids with or without disabilities. So again, we just really, really uh, thank Corey and appreciate her time today. And the last slide, Nancy, slide 37. Again, if you have further questions, you can reach us in the Mid-Atlantic ADA Center at 800-949-4232 in the Mid-Atlantic region. We serve the District of Columbia, the states of Delaware, Maryland, Pennsylvania, Virginia, and West Virginia. If you're outside the region and you need to contact us directly, you can reach us at 301-217. 0124. You can email us at adainfo at transcend.org or visit us online at adainfo.org. The toll-free number, if you're outside of our region, will connect you to your own regional ADA center. And so we appreciate you all joining us today. And again, the session will be in the archive uh, within uh, a matter of days. Thank you so much for joining us.